Good day, good folks. You are listening to Talk That Keeps You Woke. And with your awakening, we hope that you will take in the information and knowledge we provide. So make sure you like and subscribe while you hop on this ride as we inform, persuade, entertain, and engage in discussion. Welcome to Pot Liquor Podcast, which is knowledge to feed your soul. I may go one half of Pot Liquor. I go by Dr. A, the inquisitive one. A great debater, Mr. Slow Talker, a rhetorician, and an all-around nice guy, and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. The other half of Potlicka is my homie, my dear friend for more than 30 years, Kim Parker Jackson Esquire, the legal one, Mrs. Creativity, never obnoxious, the gifted one, a terrific lady, and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Okay, partner, what's up? How are you doing this week? Hello, 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 everyone. I am doing well, and I had a great week, Dr. A. It was um, very busy, but I was the MC at my kids' piano recital this week. And as you can see, I've unleashed my natural curls <laughs> so I could uh, be ready for, for that uh, occasion. And I can barely get my hat on today, but... We made it through another week. I'm happy to be here. And how are you? I'm okay. I can't complain. Uh, the semester is winding down. So um, some of my students are in panic mode because they haven't completed all the assignments. Uh, but be, me being a kind professor, I do give them a chance to make everything up. Uh, but other than that, I'm doing well. And so welcome to Pot Liquor Podcast. And as always, if you're following the show, you know, we always start off with our wow for the week. And our wow stands for words of wisdom. And today we're coming from a former, well, an Olympic gold medalist uh, who attended Tennessee State, uh, Miss Wilma Rudolph. And her statement of wisdom is the triumph can't be had without the struggle. And this is apropos when it comes to um, civil rights, basic human rights. You know, uh, it takes struggle to go out and change things. You have to put the work in. She's coming from an uh, athletic perspective. She was a sprinter. So I, I imagine she's saying, like, the struggle is the workouts the preparations, everything before the race is very important. And if you don't put the work in, you won't succeed and you won't be triumphant. What do you say? As usual, Dr. A, you nailed it. And I think I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. And I always tell my kids, just like you said, the only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. Hmm. I like that term that you use there. I'm still that from you. So, yes, so William, William, Wilma Rudolph, sorry, the triumph can't be had with <clears throat> without the struggle. Indeed. And let us move on. Oh, what's going on? What's going on? Okay, so it seems like another horrific school shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville mm. uh, took place. Uh, the question is, when is this all going to stop? When can we not deal with these shootings that are going on in schools? And then why are these people choosing to use schools to make a point. Um, so we have six victims, well, probably more, but we have six people who died from this. Um, we have a, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing the word wrong, and Evelyn, I think it is the caucus of Mike Hill, who's a 61 year old uh, custodian, Catherine Kuntz, Who's a, he was 60 years old and she was the head of the school. 
They had a substitute teacher named Cynthia Peak who was 61. Haley Scruggs was a nine-year-old student. William Kinney was a nine-year-old student. And Evelyn, like I mentioned first, she was a nine-year-old student. student. Those who are watching on YouTube can see the faces of these victims. And there's no other way to explain it. Like, this is just tragedy when people lose their lives uh, for really no apparent reason at all um, at the hands of a deranged, upset individual. It's just shameful. Indeed it is. And I, I'm at this point, I mean, you know how I feel about this. And at this point, I feel like this is exhausting. This, I feel like a broken record. And I'm really tired of having to say that this just underscores the need for sensible gun legislation. And until, you know, the Republican Congress people do their jobs and until they stop being paid by the gun lobby and put people over money and over their own selfish, uh, their own selfishness with wanting to be reelected and just collect money from the gun lobby, then this is going to unfortunately continue to happen because I think that the answer is the reasonable gun control legislation. And let's just start with an assault weapons ban. I mean, I don't see why we need to have weapons of war, um, you know, held, held by regular citizens. Like why do regular citizens need weapons of war? And we need to just have a national assault weapons ban. I mean, and there's evidence to show that where there is a, a, a ban of this nature, we don't see these types of um, incidents continuing to, to, to happen. So I think it's going to require some real leadership in Congress because there's always there's already um, pending legislation um, by the, the, the Democratic Party. And so we just need Republican members of Congress to cross the aisles and support this legislation. And until then, unfortunately, this is going to continue to happen. I mean, this obviously this person has some mental health issues as well. We can start there, okay? Number one, assault weapons ban. Number two, let's find a way to keep these weapons out of the hands of people who have mental health issues. That's not hard to do. So uh, let me jump in right there. <laughs> it's difficult to do if um you know, you require unless you require this testing prior to. Um, like they do a background check on you. That's what they do. So if you don't have a history of mental health issues. Um, what say you? I I don't know if you should be required, or maybe part of the legislation is you should be required to take some sort of test. Well, I mean, it would it would be a part it would it would be a part of a a background um a background check, but there's people who don't who feel that they shouldn't um and there shouldn't be background checks because they feel like they have a Second Amendment right, and I agree with this. I I, I don't have a problem with your Second Amendment you know Second Amendment right, but I just feel at some point we have to relinquish our right. In, in this case. So if I if I know that I have a Second Amendment right to hold, hold assault, an assault weapon, and if I thought that I could save children's lives, I would relinquish that right and turn in my weapon. I think we need, I think that's the solution. We need some leaders, some owners of, of assault weapons to voluntarily Turn, relinquish their Second Amendment right to hold it and to turn it in. That's what I think we need. And perhaps the government could compensate people for their weapons. But we have to do something. We cannot continue on as if, you know, nothing nothing can be done because something can be done. 
I agree with that. Something needs to be done, but I think just, you know, um, I, and I'm not p- playing devil's advocate here, but just uh, some pushback. Sometimes the people who don't want uh, the mental health uh, background checks is because of anxiety disorder that a lot of people may have, and that will flash. And so you're saying people who have anxiety wouldn't be able to purchase a handgun. And I I don't know how fair that is or unfair that is. Well, I think that, you know, if you, if, if when we put in measures to solve a problem like this, okay, some people are going to be negatively impacted, but if we're going to have a positive income where we're, we're a positive outcome where we're, we're saving children's lives, then I think that it's worth it. You know saving I mean? anybody's lives uh, would be worth exactly. it. You know, at, at, yeah, because at this point, we're all playing Russian roulette. I mean, it could be at a school. It could be at a church. It could be at a grocery store. It could be at a, you know, a mosque. It, it could be. It could be so, out in the open. Yeah, right? like the guy in right. Vegas that was shooting out of his window. Exactly. Uh, so that we're all we're all basically uh, with nobody safe. That's the bottom line. I, I, I want safe. to put. Um, I want to make a statement about what can we do to protect these schools? Mm-hmm. I think that can be done. I don't think once school starts. I don't think anybody should be able to walk in an open door. Like a door should be locked in the school. The outside, you shouldn't be able to freely just walk in. If you have an if you have an appointment, there should be somebody there. There should be some security there, you know, um, to check you in. Uh, And I think that can be done. I think you should have locks automatically, and then the front office will have to buzz you in or somebody would have to come down and get you. Um, Okay. Many schools already have that. But, but the other thing is that in this case, the shooter shot through the door. So, I mean, what are you going to put up? Like iron bars and well, no bulletproof, bulletproof windows. This is crazy. Like I don't care how crazy crazy. it is. This is happening over and over again. We have to talk like, like we have to talk about this when we're talking about protecting Babies, innocent children who but are just I'm not, no nobody's money. arguing against protecting, not protecting them. This would be protecting them. Th- to me, this should oh, you're saying in addition to the legislation. Yeah, it should oh, be okay. like what 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 can we do? This is happening at schools, so we know this is going on at schools, at elementary, at public schools, at private schools. This was actually a, this I, was a private school. Exactly. At, so, so, so what I'm can, saying is these schools should be protected more. Now we we've come to uh, a situation and like, look look, police didn't used to have body cameras, right? But they have body cameras now, so that's an advancement, right? I so, went to school for twelve years and we never had this issue. I never had to do a shooter drill. I never had to go through a metal detector. I never had to do any of that. It doesn't matter. Life has changed since we were kids. I'm not going to throw our age out there, but we went to elementary school a long time ago. Times have are different now, far different. It, would, it's I mean, not even we. I walked to school growing up, right, unsupervised. Yeah. I didn't walk with my parents. I walked to school. That right. Me too. Me too. Everybody, everybody is dropped off now, so the world has become a more dangerous place. Saying it, it's ridiculous. Okay, yeah, it is, but but it's clearly it's, America is is more dangerous than other countries, though. Other countries do not have all of these shootings. But that doesn't mean anything when you say It does mean something because you can't get assault rifles in the other country. What I'm saying is nobody's disagreeing with you. What I am saying to you is while we're trying to get legislations, one thing we can do is make the school safer. It sounds like you're saying we shouldn't have to do that. Yeah, we do now. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, we do. On top of the legislation, yeah, we need to get rid of weapons of war. I agree with that. Assault right. rifles, I agree with that. I think these bills should be, but we've been talking about this a long time. So my whole yeah. thing now is like, why are these people being able to walk into schools? 
Well, this why are they being shot, able to this say. person had an assault weapon and right. shot into the school. Right. So if shot they, the door down. But you if see what I'm so, yeah, exactly, because there yeah. was no security there. If there was an armed police officer there, they would have yeah. gotten shot by an assault rifle. That's what it would. Well, no, that's you don't know happen. what that can happen because their eyes are different and they're trained to look for things. So if you first of all, first of all, the parking lots from schools like where you park. You don't park where unless you drive up to the door, you got to get an assault rifle. <laughs> it's not easily concealed. Right. So you got to drive up. Somebody going to see you. Walk right. the road, and then something can happen. What I'm saying is better to have them there than not. But can I just say this as a parent? I don't know that I I don't know that I'm OK with someone inside the school with my child with my child there armed i mean anything can happen the weapon can accidentally be discharged a a, a child could steal it from the person you, take it off their hip any i i just you, that you, makes me nervous you, when you know that they're you, you know that you know that they're, they're, you know they're police officers in schools right not any of the schools that I sent. My yeah, well, okay. I've I've taught in public schools. They're police officers in school. Not not even that. When I was in Arizona, and this is Tucson, this is Tucson, Arizona. We ain't talking about New York City or Chicago. This is too, they had a police station in each school. Like a, they each had an office in the school with two wow. armed cops in the school. This wow. is this was middle school and high school. This is in Tucson, Arizona. But I don't I don't know that that is actually going to deter people who are determined to do this. If they have a weapon, they may be eventually gunned down. But who God knows what damage they can cause before they're gunned. Are down. you saying you know we I'm shouldn't saying? do it? That's what I, I'm saying. It sounds I'm like saying, you're saying that. The, the, I, listen, I think. Hold on. Hold on. I, let me let me get the question now. Let me get the question now. It seems like you're saying we shouldn't visit that or look at that as an option. Are you saying that? I'm saying I'm open to all possible solutions, but I'm just saying I think it would be more effective to have the legislation so that the gun, an assault weapon, would not be in a, a person, an unstable person's hands in the first place. I'm not disagreeing. That's all I'm saying. I'm That's not disagreeing. I'm so, not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing with that. Okay. I'm not disagreeing and, 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 with and that. I'm, I'm saying, all, but I'm saying. We we have been talking about legislation for a long time. Yeah, and what, still, still yeah. and still not there. But what I'm saying, what is happening is these folks are going to schools. Yeah, the guy in Buffalo shot up the grocery store. Yeah, you, you know, uh, uh, churches have been shot up, mosques have been shot up, right? Right. Um, uh, like I said, out in Vegas, just people in public have been shot up. But one place that this happens frequently is in public schools since the whole trench coat mafia back in uh, Columbine in Colorado, right? When we had yeah. this happen, when the, then the guy in Colorado shot up the theater. Yeah. So I agree with legislation because what I'm talking about only protects the, the school. Theater. I know the church I go to, we have armed officers. We have several police officers that attend the church. And that are security and you see them in the church and they're present because you're right. Society has changed. Yeah. The world is a, a little different right now. And so I think that's a necessary precaution. Now, you're right. This person can be a trained shooter that's deranged and could pop somebody from a distance. You know, uh, that can happen. But to me, it's better to have them there. And not to, and I don't disagree when you say it's like, wow, I got to send my kids to school with their armed officers. But what I'm saying is too much is happening. I think that schools that don't have it, these officers should talk to schools that have these officers and see how much of a difference it has made. Well, I'm open to I'm 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 open to hearing that evidence, but um you know, it just it just really makes me nervous. <laughs> just makes me nervous to have kids around around weapons. They shouldn't have to be around weapons. They're they're, you know, inherently dangerous objects and accidents happen all the time. 
You know what I mean? So how about the six-year-old that we talked about in Virginia that shot his teacher in the chest when he had a gun? He, he, he wasn't a cop. No, but the point of what I'm saying is that children around weapons can go, it can, there's more, you know, it could potentially be very, very dangerous. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And so why, if we're trying to protect the lives of our children, why are we exposing them to inherently dangerous objects? That's all. I'm saying police officers. That's what I'm saying. The police officers around the world, everywhere. So police have guns. I don't like care the if you sit if around kid, and watch. If your kid walks into a 7-Eleven and a cop is on his break getting a donut, right? He's going to see a cop. I, most kids have seen cops and know that cops have guns. You know, uh, okay. so that that that's what I mean uh, with that. Let us move on and let us move on. All right. That was a spicy debate. <laughs> now we're going to move on to uh, former president. Donald Trump. Oh God. Oh God. What 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 is he doing now? Well, you start this off. Why do we have to talk about I thought we I thought we were past having to talk about Trump and here he comes we rearing his ugly head again. But yeah, so apparently but he ain't mean to rear his head on this. I'm sure he don't <laughs> want this one. He, he don't want this smoke. I don't want this smoke. I know he was just indicted on, I don't know, what, what, what are they calling it? Indicted for paying off a porn star to paying hush money um, to, Stormy, to, a, you know. to Stormy Daniels in, in 2018. Um, I think it was before the election. Before okay. the well, actually, no, it was 2016 yeah. for an affair that he had with Stormy Daniels, a porn star, in 2006. So, yeah, he was indicted in New York. And, um, you know, he, uh, to me, this is could be much ado about nothing because I feel like there there's nothing at this point that's going to keep him from uh, running for president. I mean, if he's convicted of this crime, he won't be able to vote. But there's nothing prohibiting him from running for president. You realize that, right? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. why. That's why. I'm, huh? What was that? I understand. Yeah. So that's why I'm like this. This out of all of the things and, that he has done, all of the laws that he, he has said, has I'm broken, not afraid of what's to come. Right. But my thing is, I'm just a little bit disappointed that this was his first indictment <laughs> like why after the january 6th committee came, uh, turned over all of this evidence of him inciting this riot and over trying to attempt to overthrow the election they turned over all of this evidence to the justice department and there's no indictment like that's the one we need him indicted on, because to me, that would seem to come with harsher penalties. And I, I feel like nobody cares about this affair that he had with a woman back in 2006. While I, I would be happy to see him in handcuffs and see him in prison for all of the things that he's done. I mean, there's a long list of all of the lies and all of the laws that he has broken. Um, so I would like nothing more than to see him imprisoned, but I'm not sure if this is the one that's going to get it done. I mean, how about him trying to steal, uh, the, steal votes in Georgia? I mean, we have him on tape, like basically begging for votes to be changed. Yeah, that's still pending too. Right. So I, I need for everybody who can possibly indict Donald Trump, I need you to get cracking and 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 do your jobs. Because the last thing I want to see is him run for president. L listen, if he runs, <clears throat> he's not going to run uncontested. Um, and so that says a lot right there. And trust me, when he's on his campaign and he's debating whoever he's going to debate, the, the indictment is going to come up, you know. Um, 
Like, and he's going to say he's not to be trusted. Right. This is, but he's running against another Republican. This is not the. I'm talking about in the primary. For example, right. uh, Mike Pence. Or and, DeSantis. Yeah. And Mike Pence is shuffling backwards. Right. Talking about this is tra like Pence, my advice to you, I wouldn't say anything uh, to help this man out after what he did for you. He has n no care in the world right. for you. He called for you to be yeah. like <laughs> uh, to be hurt. Yeah. So I don't understand why you're vouching for this guy. Um, I think the one thing that we have to do, and I know it's not going to happen since we have a Republican controlled uh, House of Representatives, even though we have a democratically controlled Senate, it would be great if they would close this loophole and make it clear that anyone who is convicted of a felony is not qualified to run for president. We need to do that because that uh, there's no law in place that says that. I'm, I'm not worried about uh, Trump. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, you know, people he, said that the first time. He, he, he lost the second time, though. And it was clear that folks didn't want him in the White House the second time. Uh, it, it, was no, yeah, it, was, it was clear. Yeah, it was clear. Those votes were almost. No, it wasn't. No, I mean, after those, if it, if after it those mail in votes in, came in, in after, after those mail in votes came in. You know, I don't I'm not I'm not concerned about I don't think the country, even Republicans, most Republicans don't want to see him back because he's too much of a, a disturbance. I hope you're right. So um, they might agree with some of his issues, but there are other Republicans that are close to um, his ideology and his way of thinking. Well, I, it, it appears that a lot of Republicans are trying to distance themselves from him. So that's a good thing. But Lindsey Graham is still caping for Donald Trump. So I just want him to go away. Somebody, can you please uh, go ahead and convict him, get him convicted and get him in prison so we don't have to deal with Donald Trump anymore? Thank you. All right. And let us move. Oh, on. by the way, this is important. Since his indictment, he raised $4 million off of this. That's scary. So people still, I think, support him. But anyway, let us move on. And let us move on. And let us move on. But I heard that. All right. So next up. <laughs> State Senator out of California has proposed a bill entitled the Ebony Alert Bill for missing black children and young women. According to the LA Times, the bill will ensure that resources and attention are given so missing black women and black children receive the same attention that their counterparts receive. What say you? Well, I am I definitely a proponent of this legislation, um, but I mean, as usual, I have questions and I know we don't have answers to those questions at this point, but I still feel the need to ask the questions. And basically, I, I understand, I, I, I see why we would want to have an ebony alert, just like we have amber alerts, but how is this going to actually cause the media to focus on black children and black women who go missing. I mean, because well, I mean, it's, right not, now, it's not the media as, as much as they want law enforcement to focus on them. Okay. Let me read okay. it. According to, to, um, to the Black and Missing Foundation, 38% of children reported missing in the U.S. are Black. The U.S. population is 14% Black. Black children are disproportionately classified as runaways in comp comparison to their white counterparts who are classified as missing. And therefore, many Black children do not receive the Amber Alert. Black women and girls are at increased risk of being harmed and trafficked. Uh, a recent report of human trafficking incidents across the country also found that 40% of sex trafficking victims 
were identified as black women. So SB 673, that's the name of the bill, would authorize a law enforcement agency to request that an ebony alert be activated if that agency determines that it would be an effective tool in the investigation of a missing black youth or young black woman. But but my point is, is there was nothing that was prohibiting them from authorizing such a thing with the Amber Alert when a black person was missing. So if they didn't do it with the Amber Alert, what I, I don't understand, like what is going to cause them to do it with the Ebony Alert? You see what I'm saying? I guess the resources. Uh, can you elaborate? I don't know. I guess like they're talking about uh, m m monies. Like okay, so when you have to investigate somebody, it takes time to do so. So sometimes like they're saying they're classifying African-American kids as runaways. Like, like, oh, yeah, he just ran he away. He ran got away. missing. Right, right, exactly. So what changed? Just because you have an ebony alert now, now you're going to say, okay, he's well, actually... If there, if there are resources that, um, that are going to be dedicated to an ebony alert, yeah, that, that might happen now. This okay. has been going on. Like, the, they, the, these disproportionate numbers. Right. Um. They have been going on. And we, we get Amber Alerts, you know, all the time. I know. It comes on your cell phone and you get and that your watch. Yeah. And it tells you what vehicle they were in, the license yeah. plate number, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm all for it. I'm all for solutions. Um, you know, especially when it helps these uh sort of uh dis, you know, what do you call it, disparate situations when it's one thing for white people and another thing for black people. So if it's going to help more black people, I'm a proponent of it. Yeah. Yeah. And let us move on. Okay. So we are going to move on to our second plug, but I am also going to mention our first plug because we did not do our product for the day. <laughs> so we're going to take on two things here at one time. First, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about New Balance the sneaker. All right, it's a product that I use. I just picked up a new pair of these. Oh, those you are can nice. See the cushion in the bottom. I'm a heavy guy, <laughs> so <laughs> when I run, I need a lot of cushion, or I'm heavier than what I used to be, let's say that. Mm -hmm. And it's all about comfort as you get older. You know, style, I try to, you know, fashion a little bit, but it's more about practicability with me. Um, so, yes, that's one. And the second thing that we're looking at is our brand, which is Google today. So being a professor in school, Google is used a lot. You know, the Gmail, the Google Drive, contacts, YouTube is owned by Google, um, Google Search, Google Maps is used by me. Also, you, you got Google Slides. You have everything. So Google is the brand today. Um, of course, is uber successful. Um, but this is something that just like almost like your cell phone, like it's hard to go without your cell phone yeah but for me it's hard to go without google you know uh because it's become uh such a part of my life so mm -hmm. yes google is next and let us move on <laughs> We have a question. It's a question. Address the question. This is a question. So what's the question? Answer the question. Okay. So the question of the week is, what is always coming? 
but never arrives? That is our question of the week. The first person to answer it by emailing us at potliquorshow at gmail.com will uh, win the prize that we have for you. You put it on the sh- on the screen. I will do that in a second. For those I'm those trying to comments. give out the answer for last week. Give me a second with that. So last last week's question was, what gets what gets wetter the more it dries? And the answer was the towel. The towel was the answer to uh, last week's question. And for those of you watching on um, YouTube or Twitch, um, our email I just put up pot liquor p o t l i q u o r s h o w at gmail dot com. That is the email address you're going to email us at, and. And let us move on. All right. So we get to the portion of the show that's very informative. We have a guest. Well, hello there. Let me introduce our next guest. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Let me let me bring you in the right way. Let me bring you in the right way. Okay, so our next our guest is Dr. Madeline Sutton, also known as Dr. Madeline. She is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist, nationally recognized author, speaker, and CEO of DrMadelineMD.com. She has over 20 years of experience working with women as a physician and as a scientific expert, having also served at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She specializes in sexual and reproductive health helping busy women reach their personal goals for optimal gynecologic care and birth control needs on their time so they can have maximum freedom and control. Dr. Madeline earned her BS in psychology pre-med at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., her MD and MPH degrees from Columbia University, and she completed her OBGYN residency at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New York. Jersey. So Dr. Madeline is qualified to talk about uh, any number of things, but today we're going to focus on sexual health as a part of overall wellness. And we're going to dive into the five steps to sexual freedom. Please welcome Dr. Madeline. Hi, Dr. Madeline. Hello, you? <laughs> you have done so much. I mean, we, oh. you know, we had a lot to, uh, but we want people to know that we're talking to an actual real expert. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited <laughs> to be here. Thank you for the invite. Good, good. So tell us what exactly are those five steps to sexual freedom that you talk about? Ah, yes. Yeah, so the five steps. So, um, these are steps that I came up with after, you know, years of working with women and kind of my own personal journey and things that I would hear over and over again when I was talking to different women. So um, the first step is um, something that sometimes a lot of people take for granted. But uh, the first step is self-awareness. And when I say self-awareness, I mean, you know, just having the, uh, the wherewithal, the strength, the, um, the courage to examine where someone is personally in terms of their sexuality and and all of that stuff. But it also means like on an anatomical uh, place, um, knowing what your body looks like. What does your body look like? What feels good for you? What doesn't feel good? And if you do have a partner, being able to kind of share that. So that's the first part is um, self-awareness. The second thing is know your options. And when I say know your options, that could include a range of things for for cis women who have heterosexual partners. And when I say cisgendered, I don't know if you guys know what I mean. So I just, okay, okay. Well, well, explain it to our audience. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So cisgender women, that basically means um, those who were were women at birth, identified as women at birth, um, as opposed to transgender women. And they may have been born um, with male 
uh, parts. And at some point in their life journey, they decided to um, transition to being a, a female. Okay. So those would be transgender women. And the other women who were born women at birth would be cisgender women. So when I say know your options, I mean um, know all the different things available to you. If you're a cisgender woman and you're trying to have sex without necessarily getting pregnant every time you have sex, then know what your options are in terms of birth control, in terms of um, safe sex, in case you want to try to make sure you can avoid infections. So that's what I mean by know your options. Okay. And um, the third thing is once you have self-awareness, you know your options, work with a provider who can get you what you need. Um, sometimes that's a physician, sometimes that's a nurse practitioner, midwife, a range of folks are out there. Um, the fourth thing is establish a safe space. Sometimes we don't understand that enough, or sometimes we take for granted the importance of having a safe space. And sometimes it's very hard for people to get to, you know, especially if you're busy, if you're um, living in a space with other people, um, but establishing a safe space is very important. And lastly, um, would be just to activate whatever those previous four steps were, activating them not only once, but anytime something shifts in your life that might require that you reevaluate and evolve a little bit differently. And that topic comes up a lot. The topic of evolving and shifting comes up a lot for um, uh, women in our age group who are going through like perimenopause and menopause. They're they are trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I do this sexuality thing differently? Right. And I think it's um, always refreshing to have that conversation because, um, you know, historically we've been told that women kind of lose their their desire at that age, but more and more women are like, no, I have the desire. I'm trying to get my partner to keep up. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. So when you talk about um, acquiring birth control or knowing what your options are, is that so that you are not concerned about an unplanned pregnancy and therefore you will feel less inhibited and more sexually free to enjoy your partner or yes. as you say with your safe space it could be by yourself who knows i mean i don't know but it could be by yourself you know um definitely there's a whole range of things that you can do by yourself with toys and other things but if you have a partner and you are interested in having sex and not necessarily getting pregnant at the time then yes the the idea behind making sure you understand birth control options and choose something that works for you is so that you can have more of what I like to call worry-free, joyful sex. You know, there's a whole range of emotions that you don't have to necessarily have at the top of your mind if you're having sex for the fun and enjoyment of it, but you're not necessarily interested in having a child at that time. And sometimes, um, you know, I think historically, a lot of what we've been taught when we were younger is that you have sex for these certain purposes and that anything outside of sex for the purpose of having children is not necessarily good. And I think that's not really the way we should think about it. You know, we have these body parts that are with us for our whole lives, even when we're outside of the aged window of being able to have children. And, you know, we have those body parts for a reason. So let's right. uh, make sure we understand them and use them and enjoy them. And I guess you also um, don't want to have to be worried about STDs. So that makes you feel more, you know, free to enjoy exactly. your partner. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. And and then the other question I have is when you talk about the first step, awareness of self, um, I, if you as a woman, um, you have come to know yourself very well and you know what it would take to please you sexually, how do you balance that with not hurting your partner's feelings if you have to tell them that perhaps they're not doing something the way you need it to be done in order to fully enjoy the experience. Do you have any advice on that? Like what is a tactful way or I don't know, even, I, I, or a way women can feel more comfortable uh, making their desires known? Yes, that's a great question, Kim. You know, um, I don't know if it's, I've, I have a range of uh, responses because sometimes when someone has had a partner for a long, long time, it might be easier, right? Because ideally, if they've been partnered for over a decade or so, they have a communication style that kind of works for them. They can say things to each other more easily. They can have real talk in a way that won't offend the other. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people are, are sensitive. And so um, when people are sensitive, I think 
one of the nice conversations I like to have with my ladies is that sometimes if they have a sensitive partner, they will frame it as, oh, you know, I was in my doctor's office the other day and we were talking about this and and she suggested I, you know, I use someone else as part of the opening the door. Oh, if that makes it easier, if you have a sensitive partner who um, may have trouble hearing some things, I think it's always a great angle to kind of say, you know what, I saw my doc the other day and she, we were talking about this and she suggested X, Y, Z. Um, I think that's a, a nice way to open the conversation. And then I have other ladies who, you know, in this time of like social media and different ways that people meet partners, I have some folks that have no problem saying what they need to say to a complete stranger, <laughs> because maybe that's the only reason that they're seeing that person would be to have uh, sex. And so Good they point. are Yeah. Uh, open book when it comes to sharing what they want and need. Right. There will be no faking of orgasms. In that. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, you, you're not get it done, buddy. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So let me jump Go in right this now. Organ and do this let, 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 let me let me jump in right now. I think that I need to <laughs> have my voice heard. Here. So it, <clears throat> just and and I'm, I'm speaking strictly like over the years we've been educated on the male and female bodies. Um, as men get older, sometimes they suffer from low libido and they suffer from low testosterone. This is a real thing that yes. happens. Um, they say men, their sexual peak is around 25 years old, 25 to 27. Women reach theirs at the age of 40. So there is a difference going on. So the masculinity in men, men may have, you know, it begins to grow more sensitive if your instrument is not working anymore and your instrument cannot be working due to several things like a lot of uh i'm gonna just speak for african-american males a lot of african-american males suffer from hypertension so they have high blood pressure and sometimes taking blood pressure pills the doctor physicians will tell you that will cause you also to have low libido there are testosterone shots that you can take that might it, that's the possibility that they could have you with that. They have this shock wand therapy um, to increase the blood vessels in your penis so you can maintain an erection more so like when you're younger. I, I encourage men all the time, like your health is really going to play a role in your sexual performance. And then when your sexual per performance or activity decreases, you become more sensitive because growing up mm -hmm. you hear like being a man part of that not just being a protector and bringing home the money is being able to put it down in the bedroom right mm -hmm. uh, to stay erect and perform sexually you know like a lion but then when your lion <laughs> reduces itself to a kitten again <laughs> then it's, a hard, it's a hard topic or a sensitive topic to touch. So I do understand what Kim saying, having that careful conversation. But I would tell women, when you have the conversation, think how that male is feeling. Absolutely. You have to try to put yourself in his shoes because when you're talking about him, he, he, he thinks you're talking about his manhood. Um, I try to tell brothers not to receive it that way. You know, you have your woman, you just can't forget about her. Um, if people, you know, when, we, when you're young, you feel like the world will end at 40. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I teach young kids, they think like, well, you old. I'm like, right. no, we're not old. Like people are still engaging in sexual activities late into their 70s. It goes on. Yeah. So it is, a, it can be, you have to know your partner. I agree. I agree with Dr. Sutton. Like, I was going to say the thing, same thing. If you've been married for over 20 years, that conversation should be easier um, to have. Uh, but I do agree it takes a gentle touch to have it because yeah. it, awesome. when men, if men tie their manhood to their sexual prowess, then that's when you sometimes I would say, I mean, you don't have to, but I would warn you as a friend, like <laughs> I think you need to be careful. Yeah. With but a question I have you, because I, I teach a lot of younger kids and, mm -hmm. you know, over decades, things change. Right. So as far as like when Kim and I were growing up, right, I know like 
if a woman had more than one partner, she was labeled. Mm. Oh, uh, she's a hoe. She's a whore. And it was a double standard. Yeah. Um, but today, women today in school, and I teach at a PWI and a, a HBCU. So it's not, this is not about race. Women with these dating sites are more openly aggressive, like to approach men, you know, um, and men say like, they don't have to do a lot today because all they have to do is post and somebody's going to swipe right. And it's like, oh, wow, I got these people interested in me that I would have never known were interested in me. But I think when they're doing these hookups, and I'm not saying every kid is like this, but when these folks are doing these hookups, they're using protection doing the penis vagina sex, but they're not always using it doing uh, mouth to penis or mouth to vagina or mouth to anal. Right. I talk to them about dental dams and, you know, the guys when you, you know, uh, perform fellatio for your 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 lady, uh, you know, or or women performing for their ladies. Or, and then I talk about a condom on your penis while a woman or a man is going down on their man. Um, mm -hmm. People think like. Well, yeah, you don't really, you don't usually catch STDs that way. And I'm like, no, 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 do your research. And I'll pull up an article for them and say, yeah, what, what is a dental? A lot of people haven't even heard of dental dams. Right. They don't even know what they are. And for our listeners, a dental dam is a little like, kind of like a plastic, almost like saran wrap type of girl mm -hmm. that you put between um, a lady or down near the vagina before you engage. So, um, like that, that that is something like when you talked about that like that is to me one of the most important things like really protect yourself given what's going on on out in the world absolutely and i'm glad you brought up those points because um something that's probably not talked about as much is i don't know if you guys have seen like that when the national reports come out in terms of sexually transmitted infections what's been happening but each year over the last several years STIs or sexually transmitted infections have been increasing in this country. Mm. So it's even more important that we have these conversations about how do you protect yourself, whether you're having um, vaginal sex, uh, anal sex, uh, oral sex, you can be exposed to and acquire gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis in any orifice, mm. in any hole in your body. So it's, it's really important to have that conversation. So, um, you know, I get that all the time from folks that, that, that question about, you know, will it feel the same? And, you know, it, it really, you, you have to be a little bit creative with it. You have to throw some, you know, maybe some flavors in there or just um, some different things that might help you do it in a way that protects you and your partner, but also feels good and feels exciting. So, um, so absolutely dental dams. We have, there are female condoms that people can use that a lot of people don't like because they find it quote unquote messy. But, um, you know, we have different options out there. It's just a matter of figuring out what works for you. Also, there are sometimes people, if they decide to be a monogamous couple, sometimes if they don't like using those devices, they'll go in and they'll get tested together. And they'll yeah. say, okay, if we're going to only be with each other. Let's yeah. make sure we're starting from a clean slate. And that way I can feel more comfortable about, you know, maybe not using something. Yeah. But, you know, that's a very individual decision. Sometimes my ladies are like, well, how did I get that? We're monogamous. I'm like, you're monogamous. You can never say what your partner is doing. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> that's an excellent point. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, ne it's never easy knowing what your partner is doing. And I, I just found out at my university, like, you can get blood tests. You can get tests to go to the doctors both. And I, and I tell that to me, that's one of the most responsible things to do, but I still say protect yourself all the way around when they ask the question, but they don't feel the same. I say it feel better than an STD, right? <laughs> or, or it feels, or it feels better knowing that, you know, you just impregnated a woman and that's a long haul. So you're going to let that seven to 10 minutes and you got an 18 to 20 year haul with the kid. You got to weigh those things out. Like you, cause you got to think about your, future because it is is it worth if your plan is not to have a baby at 19 and most of the kids that's their plan not to have a baby at 19 years old and you have to really think about that you know Absolutely. um 
you know, yes. uh, people think it, it, it gets hot and heavy and it can go from zero to 60 real quick. Um, but one thing I'm finding out, all races, this is not just a black issue, this is a white issue. Parents are really not discussing sex education like, yeah. you know, they should be at home. They're not educating your, their kids on it. And, and I know I'm in the Bible Belt now. I'm down in Texas. Abstinence is a big thing. But to me, you can tell them to remain abstinent, abstinent and, and still educate them at the same time. You know, you got to educate them about their body. You know, like you're at a level where you're, you're a woman now. You know, you're a man. You can, you produce, you know, uh, semen. And, you know, woman, you have the, you can get fertilized and you can become pregnant. You know, if you stay away from sex, yeah, you won't have that issue. You know, if you do self-enjoyment, yeah, you won't have that issue. But once you bring another party in, that that's a possibility. And they're not being talk to at home about that yeah, yeah. no i think you're right um especially in um some of the southern states where a lot of times you just can't get well at the school system sometimes you can't get the parents to approve to let the school board allow the courses to be taught in the schools and then at home some people are just shy or maybe they don't even know themselves but um i agree with you 100 percent. the number of times i've had parents in my office trying to you know whoop a 12 or 13 year old because they thought they weren't having sex and they come up pregnant. Ooh. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And the, the reality is, and this is what I tell the parents every time, especially if they catch it early enough and they're able to do whatever next step they need to do. Um, you know, if you don't talk real talk with your young adult, your, your teenager, and let them know that there are certain body parts that are going to feel good in a certain way that they won't be used to, and if they're not prepared for that, it can get overwhelming. And like you said, stuff can go from zero to 60 or zero to 180 real quick. Yeah. You know, um, clothes fall off, things happen. You know, it's just it's one of those things that we have to be ready to deal with and talk honestly with our young people about so that they'll be prepared. Oh, yeah. You know, um, mom told me this was going to feel great. Let me go get the, the condoms that, you know, I carry in my purse or, you know, I have three sons um, when they were coming up. I just had a drawer. You know, I was like, I got condoms in this drawer. If you don't want to ask me any questions at a certain wow. time, just grab a condom. You That's know, a good just, idea. Yeah. yeah, just make sure you replenish it and, and you keep it moving, you mm -hmm. know? Scolding and whoopings, it doesn't beat the power of sex. It, I agree. It, it just doesn't. Like, I, I would have took it. Once I started having sex, I would have took a beating any day for it. <laughs> so it's just like that. But, and, and what I'm saying is like, you can't underestimate that power. Like God put us on the planet and made that for most people. There are, there are women and men that have pain doing sex. And I, I, I'm not trying to go down that street, but I, I just want to let folks know. But for most people, it's an enjoyable thing. And so it's so enjoyable. It's so powerful that don't think that you scolding somebody is going to make. I know people who ran away from home. Right. You know, and. To, to to live with their boyfriends yes you know, um and and things like that nature so like i said mm -hmm. you educate your child and talk to them about it at least they'll be prepared for it exactly. eventually it's going to happen you it's, know. it's definitely going to happen yeah. <laughs> So I do have another question. So you you talked about sexual health as a part of overall wellness. Yes. Um, so do you mean that uh, physically, uh, psychologically, and mentally, or or both? I mean, yes, all of it. So all you know, more and more in this world of medicine, I think people are understanding more that it's not just about the clinical stuff. It's not just about checking your blood pressure. It's about how are you doing overall as a human being trying to navigate through all these different things that we have going on in our lives, you know? And so, yes, sexual health is a part of that. Mental health is definitely a part of that. When you are sexually healthy and if you're able to feel comfortable expressing your sexuality, how you enjoy doing it and in ways and places that you enjoy doing it, you're going to have reduced stress. You're going to have um, a better sense about yourself, your well-being. That's going to improve your mental health. And you guys know across the board, if our mental health is okay, that has an impact on everything. You know, um, yeah. our blood pressure, 
uh, the choices that we might make in terms of the things we want to put in our body. I mean, the mental health component to all that is 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 amazing. It's um only I think over the last ten plus years being fully understood, and I think during COVID, um, people began to really talk about it and try to understand it in a different way again. So um so yes, when I say wellness, overall wellness, I mean the the whole nine. When I have someone come into my office for an annual GYN visit. We're going to hit all of those things. We're going to check your blood pressure. We're going to listen to your heart and lungs. I'm going to do your breast exam. If you need a pap test, we'll do that. We'll talk about your sexual health. And um, I got to tell you, for most people, they enjoy that conversation because it's not something that we've routinely done. Historically, Mm -hmm. docs aren't comfortable talking about sex a lot of times, especially black and brown docs, because it's something that's been kind of taboo in some of our communities, these whole sexual health discussions. But when those discussions happen... I mean, for most uh, folks, especially my older ladies, they're like, "Whoa, I'm so glad you brought that up because, um, you know, maybe <laughs> their, their vagina is a little dry and they need something to, to go there. Or maybe they are widowed and they met someone new and they're trying to figure out how to kind of navigate the new joy that they have because this new person is, is laying it down. So, you know, <laughs> all those things have to be right. openly discussed as part of your overall wellness. And we, we should. The more we discuss it and the more we normalize those conversations, the easier it'll be and the more I think um, all of us will feel comfortable understanding that sexual wellness is a part of overall wellness. Yeah. You know, know, when women talk about OBGYNs, I'm like, that is something that women have had in their lives for a long time. But men, we really don't have that. And so to me, it's just like, I'm I'm loquacious, so I'm very social, I'm very talkative, and I'm, I'm not ashamed. So I, I encourage men, and I don't care what color you, to have that conversation Absolutely. with your physician Absolutely. about how your member is working or not working. Don't be afraid to take a pill. It doesn't make you less than a man, right. you know, um, especially if you're really not taking care of yourself. If you eat right, you know, and you work out, some men, some I, I know some men who are in very good good shape, but still suffer from high blood pressure and then vice versa. Some men that are not in shape and they don't suffer from it. So, you know, sometimes it's hereditary, uh, the stress that black and brown men have to face and men period. I'm not going to exclude white men, men period, women period. But you, you taking that pill, your doctor can tell you about that. So you taking like the Viagra um, and uh, Cialis and things of that nature. If mm-hmm. Trust me, you'll feel better. Your wife or your partner will feel better. And your life <laughs> will be <laughs> enhanced, right? Uh, because um, especially like if you, if you don't self-medicate or have other vices, um, and I don't know if I want to use the word vices, but if you don't have anything else to relax you, because I'm not going to call wine a vice, but I'm saying some things to relax you. One of the things like sex to me is right next to eating. And I love to eat. So <laughs> it's just like, those are two things that, um, you know, that can calm you, you down and relax you. And it, it, it makes your relationship. If, it's, if you have a sexual, a healthy sexual relationship, sexy, a healthy sexual life, it makes your relationship better. Yeah. More intimate. Yeah. More intimate. More intimate. Yeah. yeah um, and, and especially when you you get older, you you start caring more about that, you know. Um, so I, I would encourage men who are listening to start building that relationship and that trust with your primary care doctor. Um, and if your doctor is unwilling to have that conversation, you might want to look at getting another physician. Yeah. Um, because that's in, that's, that's that's important to do that. Remember. Your insurance, you're taking care of that physician is is getting paid. You know, um, I never had a problem with any physician, no matter what color or sex they were, to have that conversation um, Mm -hmm. with me. So um, um, that's a good thing. I I encourage that because some men are like they're too prideful and pride comes before the fall. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Dr. Madeline, have you found yourself um, having to counsel a couple together um, when when a woman comes into your office and you bring the husband in or maybe the other partner? Yes, yes. Um, 
definitely that happens, especially, um, I would say the two times it happens most. So of, of course, a lot of times partners are there when a woman is pregnant and there are mm -hmm. different questions that they have. Yeah. But in the postpartum period, and then I would say this, the next time when I see a lot of partners being brought in might be around perimenopause. Um, you know, and they're kind of similar in a sense because when a woman is postpartum, her hormones are shifting. And, um, you know, if she's breastfeeding, she has decreased estrogen, which is similar to what happens when someone is perimenopausal. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that are very similar. Her vagina might be dry. Sometimes, um, you know, there's questions around, okay, doc, well, it's been six weeks. Can we get back to it yet? But, you know, they have to, they have to agree on that because, right. you know, um, I, I tell the, 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 the woman all the time, I was like, you know, I can, I'm, you're cleared. And sometimes women will say, well, I'm, if they reach out to you, let them know you told me I needed four more weeks. So, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it really, it really depends, but, but right. yes, more and more people are um, wanting their partner to be a part of these conversations because I think more and more, especially this, this newer generation uh, with social media and everything, there's, there's a lot more conversations openly about sex and activity and where people are and yeah. wanting to um, be transparent with a partner so that they can feel they're getting their needs met and vice versa, that more and more people are having those conversations. And so, yeah, I, I welcome those conversations. And what it also does, which is um, to bounce off of Dr. A's point, sometimes it opens up enough of a door that the, the male partner, if there's a male partner, might feel more, feel more comfortable, you right. know, so, you know, hey, well, this was going on. I wasn't really sure what to do about it. Um, what do you think? And what I always like to do is keep um, a small number of folks in my head of, of, of folks who I can send a male partner to if they have a specific question that is outside of my purview or if they're willing to go the next step and talk to their own primary care provider about something that they might need, whether it's Cialis or um, some Viagra or something like that, or if it might be okay with whatever medications that they're on. You know, okay. sometimes they have to look and see what other medications are you taking and is this medicine going to be okay with those other medications? Right. But um, but yes, I, I definitely welcome those conversations. I think um, they tend to be a relief for both partners when those joint conversations happen. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I always encourage them. When we were doing COVID, you know, we were doing a lot of telehealth. And that was a great time, too, because people might have their partner right there and they'd be like, right. oh, come here, honey. I wanted to ask <laughs> this while the, the doctor's on the screen. Right. Um, so, yeah, that was another good time when people were like, OK, well, let's uh, let's get our questions out there and find a way toward next steps if next steps are needed to, to get them where they want to be. Awesome. OK. And so my final question. Yes. And then, Dr. A, you can jump in here if you want to. <laughs> I'm just curious about uh, patients who may have some sexual trauma in their past, or they may have some type of psychological block from, I, I don't know, maybe like the Madonna whore complex type of issues. Mm -hmm. Do you encounter that? And, and how do you advise those patients? Do you refer them to maybe a, a psychological counselor, like a, a psychiatrist or therapist? Or, or, or what do you advise in those cases? Oh, absolutely. Um, great question, Kim. So, yeah, sexual trauma um, is something that we come across way too commonly, you know, um, mm. whether it's um, something or response that we get when we're just gathering the history or whether it's something that is triggered when it's time for a certain part of the exam. Um, it's something that comes up more often than you might realize. Mm. And so one of the things I always do is, you know, I take a step back and I say, okay, well, let's, let's talk about what's going on. If you're comfortable and tell me, you know, what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with. And if there's something that happened in your past that is, um, is that you're reminded of while we're here having this conversation. Uh, most times uh, people feel comfortable or they have a relief again if they're sharing something for the first time. There are some people that share things for the first time, um, especially if it's, it's, if it's at the point where you're trying to do a pelvic exam. Mm -hmm. A pelvic exam is something that will, um, if someone has never shared before, that pelvic exam or the attempt to do a pelvic exam is going to probably trigger something. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to take the time to have a conversation if they're comfortable, because sometimes they, they're they not comfortable with the first visit, it might be the second or third visit before there's comfort. 
But I also always like to um, suggest or um, invite them to be open to a conversation with a, a psych professional or a psychiatrist or someone who might be um, able to help them navigate something that might be a very challenging conversation for them. Um, so that's definitely something that I do. More and more, uh, you know, just like many things in this country, we're at a deficit in terms of having enough behavioral health and mental health persons for all the different support that people need. And so I find that that's something that is um, a challenge, but, um, you know, there are different resources if people are willing to consider, you know, not just a physician uh, provider, but, you know, LCSWs. Um, people who have PhDs and psychology and all that stuff, as long as people are open to the full range of providers that are out there, mm -hmm. I'm successful with um, with linking them up with someone. And most people yeah. will, will um, you know, will do okay once they have a chance to share. And, um, you know, if they need medication, if they're at a, a point of severe depression and it requires both therapy and medicines, people are open to that as well. So, um, yes. Yes, because those people who may have experienced that sexual trauma should still have hope that they can also have sexual, you know, have sexual freedom as well and, and enjoy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the good part is that most do. The, the patients that I've taken care of over the years, most will reach a place of coming to um, be a, a better understanding and feel like they are healing from that trauma and also be able to have a healthy my current day sexual relationship with someone of their choosing. So um, it's it's it can be tricky when they're first going down that path, but it's definitely doable. Awesome. OK, so before we get you out of here, you you <laughs> gave a lot of information that's yes. very important. Um, are, are you in the Maryland or the DMV area? I'm not actually. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. OK, Atlanta, Georgia. OK, we I know black women down there, too. So, um, <laughs> Because I I, I want to is is it okay that we we uh, put your information out? Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I have, your, I, have your, I have your email address. I do have that, but um, mm -hmm. I'm sure if Kim, if you have her information, because there are probably people listening to this. Like you said, you know, they might be like, okay, well, Doctor Sutton is open to have these conversations, and you know, after hearing right. her, I feel comfortable talking with her. So they right. might seek you out. So. Please allow us to, to, I always try to ask permission um, to put your information out there when we, when we uh, broadcast this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Happy to do that. I, um, I tend to practice, well, I, I do see patients actively at Grady Hospital. There's a women's health clinic there and um, at other points, other places in Atlanta. But where I see patients one-on-one -on -one is mostly through Morehouse School of Medicine at Grady Hospital. Okay. okay, well, until then, tell folks how they can follow you and support you online on yes. social media. Sure. sure, thank you, thank you. So my um, handle on all social media accounts, including Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, is Dr. Madeline MD. So that's D-R-M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E-M-D. And what I try to do on those different platforms is not only sh share um, good science and factually correct information as it relates to women's health and our bodies and everything, but also some inspiration. You know, there's so much going on, so much that people have on their heads and on their hearts. So I just try to inspire, keep people lifted and keep people encouraged. Um, I'm a big advocate for self-care uh, for women, but also for, for men. I mean, there's, uh, again, there's a lot going on in this world, whether it's um, it has to do with black and brown experiences or just experiences for women in general. And so um, that's what I try to do on those platforms, share helpful health information, public health information, as well as um, encourage and inspire. And you've also written a book that they can purchase as well on your website. Yes, yes, yes. So um, the website is www.incontrolbook.com. And so in control, what I did, I had some time, you know, when we would have those 14 day uh, mandatory quarantines back in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to do, you know, in the world of OBGYN, the world of women's health, we were kind of looking at the Roe v. Wade thing. And I was like, OK, this thing is about to be, you know, it could potentially go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things I wanted to do was really write something that could help women have access to information so that if we got to the point where we are now, where Roe v. Wade went away, people could understand, you know, their bodies, their sexuality. And mostly the book In Control is about birth control. 
So it's giving, it's trying to break through the myths. There are a lot of myths out there about birth control. You mm-hmm. know, with, with my sons, when they were like late teenagers and they shared with me that they had started, you know, we would have these conversations and, you know, there was still a lot of the myths out there. Oh, she can't take hormones because her cousin's aunt, sister, you know, <laughs> did something years ago and they gained right. weight or they had an IUD and got an infection, you know, stories from like years ago. And just the, the book is filled with information that's scientifically accurate that is written in a way to be um, understandable to anyone who might pick it up to try to read it. And I start each chapter with a myth or a statement or comment that I've heard across the years from a variety of patients and and loved ones and friends. And so um, In Control is the name of the book. And um, yeah, if they go through incontrolbook.com, I'll send a a signed copy. if they go through Amazon, it's not signed, but it is available on Amazon as well. And at Barnes awesome. And okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank so you. much. Great conversation. And we definitely will get that information out there for you. And hopefully you can become our, you know, our sex therapist on the show right. on a regular basis. Yes, I'd love to, love to come back and talk with y'all. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. You have a great one. Okay. Y'all too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> that was excellent. Yes, it was. She gave a lot of information, and I think, you know, our folks, our community definitely need to talk about this topic out in the open uh, so it won't be so taboo. taboo. Yeah, it, so indeed. I think that was great. Mm-hmm. And let us move on. Like this. Keep it, keep on. Right. Okay, so today we want to highlight our little known black history fact. And today we want to talk about Shirley Graham du- du Bois. Shirley Graham Du Bois was born in 1896 in Indianapolis, Indiana. In Indianapolis, Indiana. Her father, David A. Graham, was an AME minister, and her mother, Etta Bell Graham, was an activist within the church. She was raised to appreciate Black culture and music, and from a young age, her parents instilled in her the importance of social justice and uplifting the Black community. She wrote her first editorial to an Indianapolis newspaper protesting racial discrimination when she was 13, after she was denied access to a YWCA swimming pool. Throughout her life, she continued to advocate for the Black community. Now, before she married W.E.B. Du Bois in 1951, she had earned a national reputation as a playwright, composer, conductor, director, political activist, and author. After briefly attending the Sorbonne in France, Columbia University, Howard University and Morgan State College in Baltimore, Maryland. She received her bachelor's and master's degree in fine arts and music history from Oberlin College in 1934 and 1935. In 1932, she became the first black woman to write and produce an opera with an all black cast. It was called Tom Toms, an epic of music and the Negro. It represented her desire to preserve Black music, particularly spirituals, which she was concerned Black people would abandon. She used the sound of the tom-tom drum to tell the history of Black Americans beginning on African soil. Her goal was to connect the Black community to their roots, something beyond the history of their enslavement. Between 1938 and 1940, Graham wrote and produced five plays. Of the, of the five plays, It's Morning is the most notable. It tells the story of an enslaved woman who kills her teenage daughter to protect her from their owner. In 1943, she became the National Field Secretary for the NAACP for a year before turning her attention to writing biographies of famous Black Americans with the goal of teaching young people about Black history. Between 1944 and 19. 19- 1976, she published 13 book-length biographies featuring figures such as George Washington Carver, Paul Robeson, Frederick Douglass, Phyllis Wheatley, Booker T. Washington, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois. Her biography of Douglass, called There Was Once a Slave, won the Julian Messner Award for being the best book combating intolerance in America. And the award included a prize of $6,500. 
Again, in 1951, Graham married W.E.B. Du Bois when she was 54 and he was 83 years old. Together, together, the couple fought side by side to improve the life of underrepresented groups in the United States. In 1961, they both renounced their United States citizenship and became citizens of Ghana. When her husband died in Ghana in 1963, she took over a number of his unfinished product projects. Now widowed and without a U.S. passport, Graham Du Bois stayed in Ghana until 1966 when she was forced to leave after the president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, was overthrown. She moved to Cairo in 1966 after briefly living and obtaining citizenship in Tanzania. For the next decade, she traveled throughout Africa, Asia, Europe, and the United States, promoting anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. She remained devoted to the causes of liberation for African and Black people and world peace. In 1977, she passed away in Beijing, China, after being diagnosed with breast cancer. Shirley Graham Dubois, the very accomplished playwright, composer, conductor, director, and author who also happened to be married to civil rights activist W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm. That is awesome. Yeah. We often hear about W.E.B. Du Bois, but not the woman that was beside him, working alongside him as a civil rights and political activist as well. So that's good to know. And let us move on. And let us move on. All right. So we are to our third plug of the day, which is our podcast plug always. And as you, those who are watching, it is Drink Champs with Nori and DJ Effin. Uh, they've had a lot of interviews that went viral, but most notably, it is the Kanye West interview. Mm -hmm. uh, check them out. They have uh, a lot of viewers. They do a good show. The um, kind of like the the platform or the uh, the structure of the show is um, they're drinking <laughs> while they're being interviewed and smoking too. Um, so, but uh, they're drinking alcohol, and so some people have revealed a lot because when you get inebriated these things can happen so check out drink champs that is our podcast plug uh for the week and let, let us move on oh. and let us move on All right, so out this or that this week is New York City versus DC. Now I'm a native of Long Island, New York, uh, Long Island. And I'm a native of D.C. What? Yeah, Washington, D.C. So I'm just saying that. But I did after I graduated from Morgan State University, I moved back to uh, New York City and I lived in the city for a while. Growing up, I used to visit uh, my late uncle in Harlem, fell in love with Harlem. Um, great place to be. So New York City, um, living in New York City as a young black professional, I guess you can call me. I was working at Channel 2 News at the time. Um, I had a great time. Uh, I think five of my best years were my five years after graduating from college. You know, people usually say their four years uh, in college is their best years. And I had a great time at Morgan State University, definitely in Baltimore, Maryland. But I think my five years after college was just a whirlwind. Met some beautiful people at work. Um, had access to a lot, but why do I like New York City? Fast paced, uh, healthy in the sense that you're walking a lot, you're catching the train. I tell people you move to New York City for the first time, probably gonna lose like 10, 15 pounds in the first three months. 
because you go up and down stairs and up and down blocks and in and out of buildings. Uh, it is definitely a walking city. Um, there are the so many seem things. to be longer, too. Uh, I think the city block is the city block. Okay. <laughs> um, but the culture in New York, the diversity, like, Everything is in New York. Like you got Chinatown, you go to Queens. We got a Chinatown too. Like we can go, we can finish with my New York City, then you and and, and my DC too. Um and New York City just has a lot of culture all over. It it never sleeps. I do agree with that. Sometimes like it can be two o'clock in the morning and it seems like two o'clock in the afternoon because these restaurants would be open and so many people would be out, especially during the warmer climates. Um, you have Broadway, you have the Apollo, you have Harlem, you, you have Brooklyn, you know, Prospect Park, Botanical Gardens. Um, in Queens, you know, you had the World Fair. Uh, a lot of hip hop in Queens and the Bronx. A lot of hip hop in New York. Um, so there's so much, so much to do. You have nine. Well, in that tri-state area, you have nine professional teams: uh, Yankees, Mets, Giants, Jets, uh, Knicks, Nets, and then you have the Islanders, the Rangers, and then the Devils play right across the bridge in Jersey. So. Like I said, there's a lot going on, a lot of movies that are shot in New York. Um, the music industry is in New York. The UN is in New York. The Empire State Building, Statue of the Liberty, uh, the Circle Line. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot of culture. There's a lot of food. Um, I think New York gets a bad rap because they say people from New York is rude. I don't like to say New York is a rude, maybe a little impatient, um, but I won't say rude. And it's Far and Kim's going to give her take on both. I, when I moved to Baltimore, Maryland, and I went to Morgan State University, I met so many good people from Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. was, yes, Chocolate City. <laughs> and when I say it was Chocolate yeah. City, I know gentrification has taken over. It, it was a great city, and I'm hearing more great things about it now. Uh, Man, I have a lot of friends that grew up in Washington, D.C., still reside there. So, uh, but if I had to pick one, I, I'm, I'm going to stick with my hometown uh, of New York. But D.C. is definitely my second city. What say <laughs> you about the two cities? <laughs> I knew you would pick New York because you're from New York. But guess what? I'm going to pick D.C. because I'm from D.C. And I agree with everything you said, but just on general principles, I got to rep my city. So I'm going to pick D.C. Now, uh, you talked about New York and everything you said was right. But I always say New York is a nice place to visit, but I would not want to live there because it is astronomically priced. There's too many people. It's dirty in places and it's just too much. People are rude and everything is like super expensive. But. The all every you can just fall into any restaurant by accident, the food is going to be off the chart, it's going to be <laughs> amazing. It's going to cost you a grip, but it's going to be amazing. So, I, I do agree with that. The food, the culture, you know, just the the attractions. Um, it, it's a beautiful city, and I, I mean, it's aptly named the Big Apple, um, and it is the city that never sleeps. So, I'll give you that. But so nice to have the name it twice. <laughs> Okay, New York, New York. But guess what? Let me brag about my city. All right. So, you know, we have, I, I you know, you said you have hip hop in New York and that is the birthplace of hip hop. But guess what we got? Go, go. Go, go. Yeah. Okay. And once that gets into your spirit, it just moves you. And we also have mumbo sauce, which, which y'all got, what can y'all do with that? Nothing. Okay. Yeah. We got museums. We got all of that. And we got museums. We got, tourist attractions we've got beautiful parks we got national zoo we got you know rock creek park to your central park we got the african-american museum you can't beat that we've got i'm sitting we got cherry blossoms what you got in new york you don't have no cherry blossoms i'm sure that cherry blossoms <laughs> in new york you know but not like how we have ours in 
you know, around the region. I mean, like, like, I, the African American Museum is dope. You know, right. I understand that, but don't say what New York has. New York <laughs> has the Guggenheim. They had. Uh, Excuse the, me, you, know, you had your turn. It's my turn. You no, had you, had, you asked me. I had to respond. You said what we got. I'm just coming <laughs> up. Yeah, there's a lot of museums in New York. You know, the Museum of Harlem. You know, the Harlem Museum. I should say on 125th Street. So yeah, we got some museums. And to trump all of that. Oh, and we also have you know the universities. We got sport teams too. Yeah. You know, we got the Wizards, no, no. we got the Commanders, we got the 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 DC Cap, uh, United, Capitol. we got the Capitals, we got yeah, yeah, we got some sports teams too. And then what's your baseball top, team? Name? The Nationals, okay. Yeah, to top it all, yeah, the baseball team, we got the Nationals, and to trump all of what you yeah, just said, he's a little dirty too. Now let's keep let's keep it a buck. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the rat. Those aren't rats. Those aren't cats. Okay. <laughs> those are straight cats. They are not yeah. rats. No. But we also we got Georgetown, and then we also are the seat of power. You can't. You cannot trump that. Okay. Yeah, we have we the federal can. government, we, and we have the seat of. The we have. We have the UN. The that nation's trumps. capital. We have the UN. <laughs> we have the UN. That's global. God. Okay. That's, that's All right. Global. Okay. Let's let's do this. Let's call it. Let's call it even. Even I mean, Stephen. We 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 can we can <laughs> we can call it that. All right. So and let us move on. Well. All right. Oh hell no. All right, so this all hell no is not the best one, but it is an all hell no. So we yeah. had to do it. We had to be fair. We couldn't be unfair, but um, Mark Ridley Thomas, mm. he got convicted of fraud. Um, what he did was funnel contracts, uh, city contracts over to the University of Southern California in exchange for his son to attend graduate school there uh, free of cost and have a professorship where, where he would get paid. Now, um, at Texas A&M, they have a similar program that I was accepted in. Um, it pays your, your tuition. Uh, you get a professorship, you teach. Well, when I first got there, it was, it was a 2-2. Two -two. Now it's a 1-1. One -one. Um, so it went from a 2-2 two -two to a 2-1 to a 1-1. One -one. What does that mean? That means each semester, when I first started, you taught two, sem two, two courses. Now you teach one course, and you get paid for it. Um, they get you on the cheap. It's cheaper than the adjunct professor, but they still pay you while you're in school and you make some money, not a lot. And um, I think that was going to be the hookup, uh, but he got caught. And a lot of people um, testified like in his behalf, like uh, how great a man this was. I think he served for like 40 years and he was a trailblazer and he did a lot, but Sometimes uh, temptation gets the best of us, and um, yeah, he got busted for this. What say you? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that, you know, he was found guilty of seven felonies here for basically bribery. And, you know, I think I'm kind of torn because obviously this was wrong for him to do. Um, obviously, it was unethical. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, he, the, the, first of all, you know, black politicians are always going to be punished more harshly. I think, um, I think probably many politicians, um, are unethical, um, similarly unethical, but I think black people have to know that we're going to be, there's going to be a disparate impact if we are, um, convicted of, of these uh, types of charges. So it would behoove us to, uh, at all costs, try to avoid being in these kinds of situations when uh, the public trust has been 
entrusted to you um, and you are a public servant. Um, you know, it, it's good when we can have hold these positions of power because we can um, spread the resources and the wealth around so that it's not always going to uh, one part of our uh, society, but it is e equitably uh, distributed. It, so in, in some sense, it's great when we have this kind of power and we can use it um, appropriately. Um, but here it appears as if this politician was basically um, being selfish and <laughs> enriching himself here. Um, as opposed to, you know, um, equitably distributing resources that he had control over here. So this was just for his, you know, to make sure his son got a scholarship and to make sure his son got into this particular school and to make sure his son had money fun funneled into his nonprofit. And so, um, the, you know. I don't know. The thing that gets me about that, like you're a powerful person in California, you know, a lot of powerful people. So I would think just his letter of recommendations and Thank you. his work in what have you would right. have gotten in there. And if he didn't earn the scholarship, why well, try to get it for him? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's sad, you know, you love your son, you try to do the best, but also I guess you were doing the best for yourself too, because you didn't want to pay Exactly. Any money to USC. And I get it. It saves you a dime, but I know he probably regrets that now. Right. So it's not um, worth it. <laughs> not yeah. Worth it. 40 years and this yeah, you know, great work um maybe tarnish. I'm sure it's I was just gonna add, I'm sure it's uh um tempting because I'm sure they see other people getting away with it. You know what I mean? And so they kind of get I think uh, roped into trying to cool. do the same thing. Yeah, they try to get roped into do, they get roped into doing the same thing because they see other people getting away with it. But like I said, we're not all treat, treated <laughs> equitably or equally in these in these situations. So again, it would behoove us to, you know, stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah, and let us move on. Give it up, give it up. All right, so this week we're going to give it up to a fraternity brother of mine who is also the governor of the state of Maryland. His name is Governor Westmore. He invited the Alphas to the governor's mansion, and he said a lot he learned from his fraternity he uses to govern the state of Maryland. So, yes, we're giving it up. Those of you who are watching on YouTube see that. I have on my, 19, <laughs> oh, my 1906 uh, sweatshirt, um, and they are throwing up the ice signs uh, at the governor's, governor's mansion, so that's a great thing. So, yeah, we're going to give it up to Governor Wes Moore, who's also frat. Nice. Yeah. All right. That will conclude our show today. And to recap, as we always do, our three plugs were New Balance, uh, Google, and Drink Champs. Our words, our wow for the week were the, tr uh, the triumph can't be had without the struggle. That came from William R Wilma Rudolph. I always want to say William. All right. We covered the Nashville shooting, the Trump indictment, and the Ebony Alert Bill. Question of the week. What is always coming but never arrives? Uh, we had a beautiful interview with Dr. Madeline Sutton. A uh, little known black history fact this week was Shirley Graham Du Bois. Um, we did a this or that with New York City versus Washington, D.C. Of course, New York City took home that. Our all hell no segment went to Mark Ridley Thomas, and we gave it up to Governor Wes Moore. Um, so for inviting the Alphas to the Governor Mansion. So, in pardon. Yes, yeah, so thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us. And as always in parting, we wish you love, peace, and soul. 
And so, and we will see you next week for episode 14. Thanks for riding along with us. <laughs>